Okay, so in this video, I'm going to look at how we can actually measure specific heat capacity of a material. And we're going to be using an electronic method to do it. So let's start with our equation for specific heat capacity. Q equals mc delta T, where Q is your thermal energy, M is the mass of the object, C is specific heat capacity, and delta T is the temperature change. So the first thing I'm going to do is slightly rewrite that. So I'm going to represent the temperature change as the temperature at some moment in time minus the initial temperature that would represent the temperature change. I said we're going to use an electronic method to do this. So we're going to supply the thermal energy in the form of an electric immersion heater. So that's why we've been able to replace Q with VIT because it's an electric heater. So when we substitute that in, what we're going to do is rearrange to make the temperature the subject of this equation, because that's going to go on our y-axis. And we're going to make time on the x-axis there. So you can see from this y equals mx plus c form, our y-intercept should be in the initial temperature, and our gradient should be the potential difference times the current, and divided by the mass divided by the specific heat capacity, so that gives some guidance about what measurements we're going to need to take. So if we look at this form, we can see that if we're going to determine C, we're going to need to measure the mass of the block that we're investigating. We're going to have to measure the potential difference across our immersion heater that we're using. We're going to need the current through the immersion heater that we're using. And then at various times, we're going to measure the temperature of our block. So those are our measurements that we're going to make. Let's start off with measuring the mass. Okay, so we are going to measure the mass of the block before we insulate it, which we're going to do later. So first we need to check that our measuring instrument reads zero without no mass on it, so there's no zero error. Put our mass on and take a reading recording to the not the precision we can see there so we would record 1.016 so uh, let's summarize that so this would be the process we'd go through to start with and it's important we measure the mass before we insulate it because the, we want to know the mass of the block not the mass of the block plus its insulation and it's important that when we read or record data we record it to the same resolution as the measuring instrument. So our, our mass balance can measure to the nearest gram or 0.01 kilograms. So our mass should be recorded to that many decimal places as well. Okay, so now we've got our mass. Uh, this would be our general equipment setup. So let's run through what we've got here. So we've got a power pack supplying DC connected in series with an ammeter, which we've got there. That's in series with an immersion heater and that's connected back into our power pack. We've also got a voltmeter measuring in parallel with our immersion heater there as well. And we can see that our immersion heater is now insulated. We've got it set up in the 10 amp mode because we're gonna get big currents and the 20 volt mode because we're gonna have a potential difference of about 13. Okay, so that's our general equipment set up there. And what we do lastly is we're going to put a thermometer inside the block. So we want to measure the temperature inside the block. So we stick a thermometer in there like so. So in terms of how you would write up this as a method, we would show this in the form of a circuit diagram. So that's what we've got here. We've got our variable power supply here, which um, we put on 13 volts for this experiment. We've got our ammeter set up in 10 amp mode because we're going to get quite big currents here. We've got an immersion heater which is embedded in the block, so any energy that it dissipates is given straight to the block. We've got our voltmeter in parallel to measure the potential difference across the immersion heater. We've got a thermometer that's embedded in the block, and we've now insulated our block to make sure energy is not escaping to the surroundings or realistically we're trying to minimize any energy transfer to the surroundings there. So that's how we'd set up our equipment. Let's look at uh, the, the results that we would collect. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the temperature of the block at different periods of time. So I went for every 30 seconds as the change is gonna be quite slow. 
So in the table for this experiment, what I'd be looking for with the stopwatch I was using, it had a resolution of 0.01 seconds, so I'd expect to see all the times to two decimal places. The thermometer resolution is to the nearest degree, so I'd expect to see all the temperatures to the nearest degree. The voltmeter has a resolution of 0.01 volts, so we can see two decimal places all the way down. And the ammeter has a resolution of 0.01 amps, so again, two decimal places all the way down. And I kept collecting data until I had at least a 10 degree temperature change. So we've got a nice large set of data from which to collect our results. So I continued on beyond, beyond 150 seconds, but this is just to illustrate what the table would look like. Okay, so that's the table. So if this all works well, we should end up with a graph that looks something like this. So a straight line graph, but with a y-intercept. Uh, at the initial temperature. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the gradient of this graph. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to try and get the gradient across as big a section of the graph as I can, in this case all of it, and I'm going to clearly show on the graph how I'm calculating the gradient. So I'm showing the triangle that I'm creating and I even write down the coordinates of the corners of this triangle that I'm making and using those values to calculate gradient. So we know what the gradient is, we can multiply that by the mass of the block, which we already measured, and we can divide that by the average power supplied to the block over that period of time, and that will be our specific heat capacity. And the reason I use the average potential difference in current is because you'll notice that during the experiment that they'll vary slightly, so that's why I've got an average to give the best possible estimate of the energy transferred. And like it says at the bottom, it should be really obvious from looking at a graph how the gradient has been calculated. I shouldn't have to like hunt and work out what's going on. It should look like this um, sort of thing. OK, so that's how we would get specific heat capacity. Let's have a look at some uncertainties that would crop up as part of this experiment. So. One source of uncertainty would be our measuring device for temperature, because it can only measure to the nearest degree. So we'd say it has a resolution of one degree. And because at each moment in time, we only take one temperature measurement, our best guess at the uncertainty is using the resolution of the device. So thermometers are an analog type measuring instrument, so they measure continuously. So for an analog instrument, we say the uncertainty is half the resolution or 0.5 degrees for a temperature measurement. So if we wanted to find the percentage uncertainty in the initial temperature we measured, we would do it like this. We do 0.5 divided by 21, which was the value, uh, you'll see that in the table, times by 100, and we get 2.4%. So a reasonable contribution to uncertainty from our thermometer there. And just a side note here, we always give percentage uncertainties as two significant figures. Um, it doesn't matter what the values are. So that's the temperature. We do the same for the stopwatch. So again, um, we only used one device. We took one measurement of time. So we have to use the resolution again to estimate uncertainty. But a stopwatch is a digital measuring instrument. So we say the uncertainty is just equal to the resolution because we do not know where in between the values the measurement was. So if we do that, we can calculate the percentage uncertainty and I'm gonna do it for the first time reading. We could do it for any of the time readings. So you have 0.01 divided by 30 seconds times 100 gives you 0.033%. So the contribution from the stopwatch is tiny and it's just gonna be insignificant. So unlike maybe the G by free fall or simple harmonic motion experiments where time is a significant contributor to the uncertainty, it isn't here at all. So that's our start. We can do the same thing for potential difference, but this time we have got repeat readings for the potential difference because we recorded it with every single one of our measurements. So I'm going to use range over 2 to actually calculate what the uncertainty is, and that's what I've done here. We get a value of 0.035 volts as our uncertainty in our potential difference. So I'm going to divide that by the average of all the potential differences, and that gives us a percentage uncertainty of 0.28% for our potential difference readings. Again, not a massive contribution. So we can do exactly the same thing for our current readings. 
We've got repeat readings of current throughout our experiment, so we can use range over two to calculate the uncertainty. We divide that by our average current, and then we get 0.99%, um, so a significant contribution, but still, again, not massive. Uh, the last one we haven't looked at is from the mass. So we measured the mass right back at the start. So again, we only took one measurement of it, so we have to use the resolution to estimate the uncertainty. So the resolution is 0.001 kilograms. It's a digital instrument, so we just use uncertainty equals the resolution. And then we calculate the percentage uncertainty, so 0.001 divided by 1.016, which was our measurement, and we get 0.098, so a tiny contribution there. Again, not very significant. So let's put those together. Um, so then we can identify how we might go about improving this experiment. We can see that by far and away, the biggest contribution to uncertainty is coming from our thermometer. So if we were looking for a method to improve it, Realistically, we're looking for a thermometer with a better resolution or a smaller resolution there. That would help us get better um, readings with smaller uncertainty. Um, but one of the questions I quite often get asked by students is, why do we have to use a graph? Why can't we just measure a temperature change and then using the mass work out specific heat capacity? Well, um, to explain why, first we need, would need to calculate the percentage uncertainty in that temperature change you would measure. So I said earlier that we would do this experiment over 10 degrees, so I'm going to use that as the temperature change. And then we have to calculate temperature change, which would involve doing one temperature minus the initial temp or the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So we're going to have two temperature readings, which is why our uncertainty is 2 times 0 0.5 there, giving us a percentage uncertainty in that temperature change of 10%. And when we combine that together with all the other measurements we take, that would give us an 11% percentage uncertainty in our value of specific heat capacity if we just measure one temperature change. And this is why we use the graph method, because it allows us to reduce this percentage uncertainty considerably for the experiment. Um, so that's why in most experiments, it will lead to you plotting a graph and using either the gradient or the y-intercept, because that's a mechanism to reduce percentage uncertainty. OK, so that finishes this video looking at how we measure specific heat capacity. Um, I hope you found that useful in terms of explaining how we would go about doing about it and um, how we would process the data. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to comment and ask. I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. But thank you very much for taking the time to watch.